Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for being here today and the chance to speak to you. It really is a great privilege to uh, represent the collaboration that we've formed uh, between the University of Edinburgh and St Abbs Marine Station. And so what my objective really in the next 10, 12 minutes or so is to set the scene in terms of that collaboration and the partnership that we've built, but to uh, really make one thing really clear. This is a collaboration that's open to everybody. So everyone on this call from across Scotland and further afield, we want you to come work at St Abbs, get involved in this partnership and do wonderful research together bring students, get involved, and we'll talk about you know, how we can make that happen. So what is this new strategic partnership and what is the background to the University of Edinburgh's uh, interest? So University of Edinburgh um, has you know, a long and rich history, including in uh, marine sciences and, and ocean sciences. And it would be wrong of me, I think, this year, you know, apart from any other year, 2022, it's the year before the 150th anniversary of the Challenger expedition led by Charles Wyville Thompson of, of the University of Edinburgh. So that tr tradition is, is, is very, uh, we take it really seriously. We're very proud of that heritage and, and want to celebrate it in the new activities that we are undertaking at St Abs and, and elsewhere around the world. A little bit of context on the university, just a little, tiny uh, uh, background. So the university was founded in 1583. It's a very large um, a university in, in, in the UK context. It's ranked in the top 50 of the world's universities. And we have a real breadth of, of research and, and teaching activities. And we want to bring that to the partnership at St Abs. So we'll focus today for, the, for this audience really on the scientific activities that we have started and we want to expand upon, but we want, we want to see increasing engagement with social science, arts and humanities through this partnership at St Abs. Something we take really, really seriously. And it's the way that we're gonna achieve really successful science policy and industry engagement to achieve sustainable development in the future. So I think it's worth just putting that right up at the front. In terms of what the University of Edinburgh is bringing to this partnership, well, we are a very big organization of around 50,000 people spread across 150 countries with a vast array of, of partnerships. And some of these I'll talk about today in terms of their immediate relevance to the St. Abs uh, relationship. But of course, there's a far wider uh, group of activities that we can draw upon. Before I go to St. Abs, I just have this one slide to, to give you an idea of the breadth of the marine science and ocean related activities at the university. Now, this is something that draws from really work over the last two years, pulling together where we have activities that relate to masts and relate to activities in the global ocean. And we've created a website, it's linked at the bottom. I think uh, uh, Hannah's gonna share the link in the chat. There's a web page now where you can see who's involved in these different areas, a few of the projects that are running, some of the teaching activities that uh, are dovetail with these uh, areas. Now, cross-cutting the areas you can see on this slide, we have great expertise in Edinburgh in big data informatics, modeling systems analysis, and, and particularly remote sensing and mapping, often in terrestrial settings, but increasingly in marine. Think multi-beam echo sound and mapping and emerging technologies to really characterize habitats over, over a broad regional scale. I won't run through each and every example that I have on the slide at the moment. Really, the point is to say we don't just look at one aspect of the problem um, at the university. We're looking at marine ecology, paleo records and deep time reconstruction. So relevant to understand present day rates of change and put that in a geological context. We have uh, wonderful expertise in aquaculture genomics at the Rosden Institute. That's a big part of our collaboration with St Abs. I'll summarize in a little while. Our engineers are very focused on marine renewable energy devices, installations, new materials, assessment of uh, effects in the environment. Again, a strong opportunity with St Abs going forward. We have human geographers, people expert in development, sustainability of development trajectories. And we have a law school. And through that law school, significant um, expertise and engagement with the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, and also the really interesting emerging areas of you know, management of high seas ecosystems through the biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction negotiations. So as I say, there's a lot more information on the web in terms of that context. And what I just want to do now in a few slides is summarize the collaboration. Then I'm gonna to pass to Kevin who'll run through the facilities on, at, at St Abs and ask you a number of questions because we want to tease out what people might be interested in working on. And then we want to establish a, a, a conversation on that and get things going. So the collaboration between St Abs and the University of Edinburgh is, is brokered between the School of Geosciences, where I work, School of Biological Sciences, 
the uh, Royal Dick School of Veterinary Studies, where the Roslyn Institute is based, and of course, St. Abbs. And it's a really simple collaboration. We want to conduct research, conservation, and or educational activities at St. Abbs. Either we want to do that with our own staff and students or in, collab or in collaboration with St. Abbs, any variety of, of, of collaboration there. And we want to attract third parties. So in other words, anyone else who wants to get involved, be they members of MASTS or collaborators that you may have overseas who'd like to work at the St. Abbs Marine Station. If you want to dovetail with work in the schools you can see on this slide, that's all within scope and we'd love to hear from you. And what, if anything is, is in scope in terms of research that relates to the conservation and sustainable use of the marine environment. Here's a, a little screenshot, a very kind of COVID era image I think we're so familiar with now of the principal of Edinburgh, Peter Matheson, signing off the agreement with Stephen Nesbitt, who's the founder of the St. Abbs Marine Station. So a virtual signing ceremony back in late uh, 2020. Uh, we've signed a five-year collaboration between us. And over these five years, the university will assume the running costs of the St. Abbs Marine Station. So this is not just a piece of paper that we've signed to make us feel nice. There's a deep relationship here based upon money changing hands and a real buy-in um, from the University of Edinburgh, which we're really delighted to, to be able to announce. Now the, the job is to expand that partnership and get many more people involved. So I'm really, you know, keep coming back to that point. That's a key objective for us. So over the five years of the collaboration, we see a 660,000 pound investment in the St. Abbs facility. We've formed a joint working group and the members of that working group uh, meet every four to six weeks to take forward our, our jointly proposed activities and enhance the work of, of the Marine Station. Sinead Collins in biology sits on the group, as does my colleague Seb Henniger in geosciences. Tim Bean is uh, at the Roslyn Institute. Tim is expert in shellfish, aquaculture, and genomic approaches to uh, aquaculture. Uh, on the St. Abbs side, we have the Nesbitt family, the trustees of the Marine Station, Joel Matthew, and the founder, Stephen Nesbitt. Kevin and myself are also on that working group. So that's a kind of gallop through what took us to where we are today. And here are some initial focal areas of the sorts of research that we are prioritizing at the moment. This is not an exclusive list, but it encapsulates a lot of what it is we can do. When you hear Kevin's talk, I think a lot of you will start having other ideas. Some of them will fit under these bullet points, but you'll have ideas beyond these. And that's absolutely fine. This is where we put an initial focus. Now, St. Abbas is built entirely without iron. There are no girders holding the roof up. There's no rebar in the concrete floor. So it's a perfect place to develop uh, experiments to assess the impacts of electromagnetic fields. Kevin will talk more about that. So that's always going to be a major component, and we believe hugely important as we see the transition to renewable energy and the large wind farm developments, Mar Bank, Berwick Bank, and others that are going to be so important for Scotland and other countries. We have wonderful abilities through St. Abbs um, seawater supply to understand the impacts of multiple stressors on marine systems. Warming, acidification and deoxygenation would be three obvious ones, but we can blend in other stressors really very easily in the marine station context. We're interested in exploring new aquaculture approaches, including restoration aquaculture approaches. And then finally, things that raise awareness of our work, increase opportunities for really good interdisciplinary marine research teaching and then innovation from that. So that's my overview uh, of where we are at the moment. Please be in touch uh, if you are interested in following up or you'd like to be connected to anyone in the working group. I can't say it enough. We want to hear from you. We'd love to work with you. Kevin's got a number of polls that I hope you can answer so we can gauge where your interests are at the moment. And then, as I say, we're delighted to follow up. So Kevin, I'll leave it there uh, and over to you. Yeah, so thank you. Um, I'm just going to very, very briefly uh, run through the Marine Station for those of you who are not familiar. Um, as Murray mentioned, I do have a few poll questions, which is just really to help us um, gauge the sort of interest uh, for collab future collaborations, but also to have a bit more information on what would be required, what people are looking for, um, and how we can sort of mesh our interests uh, together. So for those of you who don't know, uh, St. Abbs Marine Station is a marine research facility that's based on the southeast coast of Scotland. 
Um, the East Coast, given how commercially and ecologically important the coastline is, I think is relatively underrepresented uh, in terms of dedicated marine research facilities. So the thing that really makes St Abbs Marine Station special, uh, I guess, is the, the area uh, that it's located. So by this, uh, I mean, we're in this really unique position where we are right next door to where the warm waters from the Gulf Stream mix with the cold currents from the, from the Arctic. And what this results in is really clear waters, it allows us to have some species that are typically found in colder conditions, such as the, the wolfish, but also warmer species, so the Devonshire cup coral. Um, it's also really special in the range of different habitat types that is found there. Uh, anything from sea kelp, uh, kelp forests to sea caves, uh, rocky reefs. But if we move on land, you also have um, a large seabird colony, um, which has been a point of interest um, for many years now. So it's a really, really diverse um, stretch of coastline. Uh, we also have to consider the socio-ecological uh, setting. Now, the St Abbs itself is historic uh, in terms of fishing families. It's been there for a long time. There's a long history of different fishing families that still continue um, to this day. Now, we've built a really strong link with them. Uh, one of the founding principles of the Marine Station was to work on local regional issues. Um, and because the fishing uh, community forms a large part of St Abbs, um, we have made sure that the work that we have originally started when we first um, finished the construction of the building involved them. We wanted to involve the local community. We also have to consider the fact that the Marine Station sits in the Berwickshire Marine Reserve. Uh, this is one of the oldest voluntary marine reserves in the UK. Um, this is voluntary, but it's also um, a Natura 2000 site and there is uh, legal protection further offshore. Uh, so the voluntary marine reserve was originally set up by the, all the different stakeholders uh, to avoid conflict and to better preserve uh, this environment moving forward. Um, with this area in particular and all the different stakeholders, we, we find ourselves in a really good position um, to, to keep those local community links whilst we expand and move forward uh, with our research. Uh, the first question I would like to ask um, is a poll. So based on these fishing communities, uh, the dive charter businesses, um, and the, the, the recreational boat users, we have a lot of um, experience working with them. They have been great, they, they welcome projects. So I guess the question is, is if you were to conduct work at the marine station, would your field work require the use of boats, be it recreational, fishing boats? And we're also in the process of establishing a dive unit. Um, so we'd be keen to know if the dive unit would become an important part of the research that you would like to conduct um, at the marine station. We'll give everyone just another second and then we'll share the results. Excellent, yeah. The boat use for us has definitely allowed us to, to, to further integrate ourselves into the community. Um, but it means that because you're engaging the local community, the fishermen, for example, have jumped on many projects that we have done over the last few years, um, simply because they've not had the opportunity to, to get involved in these um, and also to learn about what effectively they're, they're using for their livelihood. Okay, so a bit of background. So the Marine Station was established in 2010 as a non-profit uh, research organization and a Scottish registered charity. Um, it was a philanthropic uh, venture and it was um, funded, the construction of the building, the hiring of staff and leading into the, the deals that we have since had um, was all privately funded. So 2014 saw the first milestone and this was really the end of the construction phase and the beginning of the science, the beginning of integrating ourselves into um, the marine area. So from 2015 to 2020, uh, we embarked on a tripartite collaboration with Harriet Watt University and Napier University. So this was highly successful and this allowed us to maximize the use of our facilities 
but also to broaden the horizons and the reach uh, that the Marine Station had at the time. And as Murray mentioned, so as of September 2020, we signed a collaboration with the University of Edinburgh. The, the main point that the Marine Station wanted to address um, once it was completed is we wanted to contribute to local, regional and global marine issues. But we were also aware that we have this really special environment right on our doorstep. So we did want to start local and focus on the diverse coastal ecosystem of St. Abbs and wider North Sea. But one of the, I would say, more relevant points recently um, is providing training and education for marine scientists. We all know it's extremely difficult for some people to get some practical hands-on experience. And through the deals that we've had with the universities, this has allowed us to work with students um, from undergrad right up to PhD. Um, to provide a place to conduct their work, but also gain practical experience of husbandry and just running uh, a marine research facility. So having quite a sort of diverse facility, um, we have to look at our kind of funding models, um, network and education in, in a dynamic way. So funding to date um, has primarily been from philanthropic sources, but we've also had to rely heavily on different research grants. Um, so I'll delve a bit more in depth into some of the research projects, the larger scale ones that we've been working a bit later on. Um, but we've also open to creating new collaborative links, whether we work together on a project, whether we hire some facilities and space out for people to conduct their project. And likewise, public lectures, training and consultancy is something that we've touched on, um, but we're hoping to, to bring a bit more to the forefront. In terms of our networking, uh, the Marine Station is a bit unusual in that we are obviously linked with the University of Edinburgh now, um, but we're also in our own right, uh, a registered shellfish and finfish aquaculture site. Um, and we're also part of the coastal monitoring site from Marine Scotland. Um, so what this allows us to do is we can rear commercial species, work on commercial species, but we also contribute to a long-term data set uh, through Marine Scotland by sending water samples um, <clears throat> for analysis. Um, and we're obviously a member of MAST as well. Uh, this has been for a good few years now um, and has allowed us to really link up with different organizations um, so that we can expand our, our sort of reach. In terms of education, uh, I touched on the fact that we have a lot of students come through our doors who work with us, who use space. Uh, we're also an approved training facility for four EU higher education organizations, or we were um, pre-Brexit. We're not entirely sure how that's gonna change now. Um, and we also have a long-term established internship and volunteer program. Um, now, I mentioned how hard it is to get experience. I know this from, from my own experience when I was studying. Um, so we have really tried to open the door to get as many people in to work with us, to help us out with projects, to start new projects and really find their feet uh, in the field of marine science. Now, one of the other um, pieces of infrastructure that we have is we have accommodation, which is linked to the marine station. This is typically used for volunteers, intern students, but it's also used for, for visiting scientists. So this brings me on to the next poll. Um, what is the likelihood, if you were to conduct work uh, at St. Abbs Marine Station, that you would require the use of accommodation? We'll give everyone just another couple of seconds just to answer, and then we'll share the results. Excellent. Um, we find ourselves quite well positioned. Um, we're in commutable distance to a lot of large cities, um, but it's always good and worked well for us if we have people visiting from abroad to, to come and have a base um, where you can continue discussions and continue work out with standard business hours. So the Marine Station itself, um, I'll go a bit into detail here and show you some of the equipment, the infrastructure that we have and what makes it so special. So a large portion of the Marine Station is the research aquarium. So this is a 275 square meter uh, research aquarium. One of the, the important factors that we have is we have a clear roof. So this allows us to avoid the use of artificial lights unless required for specific purposes, um, which we have found over the years to be massively beneficial um, to the husbandry of a range of different species. Uh, Murray touched on the fact that the, the, the main building 
uh, has been constructed almost entirely with glass reinforced plastic. Um, anywhere that you would typically have iron or steel has been replaced with glass reinforced um, plastic girders right down to the floor. And the reason that this becomes so unique and so special is it effectively creates an area that has minimal electromagnetic field interference. So a lot of the work that we do, and I'll touch on this later, uh, involves recreating electromagnetic fields, such as those that you would find around power cables uh, to do with wind farms, tidal generators, and so on. Um, and if you were to try and do this in a, in a normal setting where you have lots of ferrous material, it's extremely difficult to have really tight control over that. We also have pumps, uh, very large pumps, which allow a continuous flow of seawater. We do have means to filter, sterilize, um, et cetera, on a project by project basis. We also have a wide range of tanks. So we have uh, small tanks, 10 liters, right up to the mesocosm, uh, which is 100,000 liters. And we've got a range of different, different depths, lengths, um, and so on. And this allows us to really approach practical work um, on our premises and allows us to get involved in a lot of different work, whether it's gradient work, whether it's large scale looking at um, fishing equipment, we can do this in the, the 100,000 liter mesocosm tank. We have a temperature controlled room. Uh, this is more recently gonna be used for coral work, but has in the past been used for uh, larval work where we needed tighter controls. This is currently being upgraded to um, a larger double unit. We have an office and laboratory space. We have the 100,000 liter mesocosm, which I will touch on a bit later. And we also have direct access to sea and dive charters. Another quick question. So out of the range of different infrastructure that we have in place, um, what is it that you could see being the most valuable to your research that is perhaps not available um, in different universities or, or organizations? So do feel free to select uh, two options if you think that there are two options that are particularly uh, relevant to you. Uh, it is multiple choice. Excellent, yeah. Um, Throughout my years at the Marine Station, we have found um, the mesocosm and the EMF equipment to be the, the most in demand as well. And I think by us having this low magnetic footprint and also having developed over the last five or six years different equipment, which allows us to uh, recreate electromagnetic fields from these cables, we're one of the few places that can do that uh, in the world. Um, there's a few uh, physics institutes that have similar rooms, uh, but they're obviously not geared up for, for marine uh, research. So we have quite a broad uh, research remit, Murray touched on this as well. Um, for a small facility, we have to cater to a large range of requirements. So most of our research can very broadly be put into three categories. So monitoring ecosystem health, sustainable management, and conservation. Now we have different projects both done in the past, currently, and in planning which touch on all three of these um, different research areas. So we can see here uh, some of the, the projects which are nearing completion or are currently underway. Um, so we do a lot of work on the fishing boats. So we've worked with different organizations and we tried to assess the fishing activity within this voluntary marine reserve, which kind of gives us um, some sort of closed borders to work with. Um, we also do a lot of work, as I mentioned, on the impacts of marine renewable energy devices. So this is the, the EMF work that we do. But we're also involved in conservation work. And recently, one of my colleagues has been doing work looking at the diversity and functional role of marine biofilms um, in different marine environments. Another question, sorry to keep bombarding you. Um, we're just really interested, I guess. Um, we've touched on a variety of different research that we have done. Of course, Murray mentioned that this is open, the doors are open. We are willing to expand our expertise and facility to allow you to conduct different research. Um, so please do have a look through this and see if there's a couple of different categories that maybe suit the work that you would like to do uh, with us at St. Abs or at the facility, uh, taking advantage of the, the infrastructure that we have in place.
So again, this is multiple choice. So uh, select your top two um, out of this and we'll close this in just a few seconds, give it a, a chance for everyone to select as many options as possible. Excellent. Um, I should have said uh, right at the get go that um, this information is, is definitely going to be taken on board. We, we want to continue discussions around this. And at the end of this uh, webinar, we'd be really keen to, to open links um, with the people who are providing these answers and see if there's ways that we can um, make these questions a reality. Another question. Um, these different areas of research, um, we have typically projects lasting from weeks up until the ones I'm about to go in a bit more detail, which are multi-year projects. Um, it would be really helpful if we could get a better idea about the sort of duration of the research that you would like to conduct at the Marine Station, whether it's short term or potentially a multi-year project. We'll just give a couple more seconds for people to vote. Excellent. Excellent. That, that, that's really interesting to see. Um, and I think what this allows us to do is if we can take this information on board and start to plan our research agenda around the potential for opening up to as many different collaborations as possible, then we can really highlight um, the, the usefulness and relevance of, of the Marine Station as a, an independent research facility. So I'll just touch on two projects. Uh, so these are two big projects that are currently running at the Marine Station. So the first one's called Elasmo Power. And effectively what we're doing with this is we are building on the research that we've done previously um, on a range of different crustaceans and moving on to Elasmo Franks. We, we know that there, is there are large uh, elasmobranch populations around the North Sea. They're likely to encounter subsea power cables. Um, and we know that they can detect magnetic and electric fields. So what we're really interested in doing by joining onto this project is we're responsible for doing the laboratory portion where we have this equipment, we have large tanks and we have elasmobranchs and we really want to have a look at behavioral changes and physiological changes that may occur when these species are exposed to uh, subsea power cables. So this is part two of a six phase project. Uh, this is a large uh, consortium, which includes individuals from industry, government, science, and NGOs. And the ultimate aims of this project is really to provide information that can be included in the environmental impact assessments, but also to help towards offshore planning, optimal mitigation methods, which currently there are none for these species, but also to get a better understanding of how these species detect uh, electromagnetic fields and potentially what impacts it would have in the long term. So some of the, the primary factors that really allow us to do this project is a lot of the work to date that has been done on electromagnetic field research uses model data. There is a deficit of in situ measurements around cables. Now, because this is a large scale project uh, over a million euros, we have been able to get in situ measurements from two different cables, Nornet and Borsell cables. Um, and this is allowing us to effectively accurately recreate both AC and DC fields, not only in strength, but also in shape and direction of these fields as well. So this is to date, uh, one of the most accurate studies that we are able to conduct on these species with the information that we have. So we'll use camera arrays to look for behavioral analysis. You can see the picture in the bottom right. This is a 15 meter long tank that has cameras located above it. Um, you probably can't see from that image, but there is a Helmholtz coil, which we use to recreate electromagnetic fields uniformly over a set area. Um, that will be used to recreate both the AC and the DC fields. We're also gonna have a look at the physiological uh, parameters, and we'll do this by doing detailed hematological uh, work. 
one of the things that we've always tried to do when we work on a range of different species, we try to include as many different life stages as possible. So we are looking to use eggs, juveniles and adults across three different elasmobranch species. Currently we're using uh, cat sharks and we're using thornback rays and we're in the process of trying to refine um, a suitable third species to, to conduct this work. So this will be conducted at the marine station over the next two or three years. Um, this will be alongside the, the other EMF research that we're doing. And we are obviously open to having people provide advice, collaborate and work with us on these species. I know from experience that work on elasmobranchs is extremely difficult to do, um, particularly in laboratory settings. And we're quite fortunate that we have the space and equipment to, to hold these animals, but also to conduct um, behavioral and physiological work on them. The next big project that we have, um, we are effectively wanting to get a bit more information on the life of lobsters. Now, this is being um, funded by a production company and will eventually be made into a documentary that will be released through an online streaming service. But what we're hoping to do is we are hoping to look at lobsters in a bit more detail. A lot of the information that we currently accept as fact was done in studies, say, 40s, 50s, 60s. Um, and whilst that is extremely relevant and does have a solid um, foundation, what we're interested in doing is using modern technology to go back and, and reanalyze some of this information. But we also want to see if we can um, follow the changes in legislation where we're having a look at lobster sentience, uh, pain reception, and so on. And there's a lot of work done recently on crustacean and the fact that they may have personalities, um, which ultimately plays a large role in determining uh, fishing surveys, offshore renewable energy surveys. If you start to think of these animals less as bugs of the ocean and more of animals that do have primitive uh, thinking and memory. So what we're hoping to do is we're hoping to create a range of different habitats uh, using modern technology, different cameras, cameras that can fit on the back of bumblebees, for example, um, and really begin to, to follow a year in their life um, with the overall goal of providing basic information but also trying to bridge the gap between what we find now and how that can be used in both the fishing context and in a renewable energy context. The documentary is looking to follow not just the life of lobsters, but also the science and the research that goes into ultimately uncovering some hopefully interesting uh, questions and answers. So I mentioned that this research, we hope to link into renewable energy. We know that there has been a lot of work done, particularly over the last 10 years, where they are looking at using scour protection zones, big concrete blocks dropped around the bottom of um, wind turbines, which prevent erosion. There's been work done where they're looking at adding different sized holes um, and creating a, a, effectively an artificial reef. Um, and what they have found is that they do find an increase in you know, lobsters, crabs, and, and a range of different fish, fish species. It makes sense that it's typically built on a, on a barren uh, landscape and you're adding artificial reefs. But what we're interested in is seeing if we can find the answers, how you could do that optimally. Now, we know there's a lot of work done uh, where people release lobster larvae and, and look at um, contributing to overall populations. The success rate of those projects, we don't entirely know. But perhaps if we can have a look at ways that we can provide better for reproducing populations of these species, that might also help bridge the gap um, to combat fishing pressures in, in nearby areas. So one of the interesting things, uh, I think Murray did touch on this, we're hoping to expand out with uh, marine research. This project has also allowed us to collaborate um, with the art community. So you'll see a picture on the top left there. This is by an artist called Philip Colbert, who is affectionately known as the Lobster Man. And what he's looking to do is he's looking to, to provide scientific data linking to his art. So what we're doing is we're wanting to have a look and we want to follow this thread where we have a look at lobster personalities and sentience, and we want to have a look at communication. Um, how deep does this go? We don't have the answers yet. But it's really, really nice to see art linking with marine science in a meaningful and productive way. I do have one final question before I wrap up. Um, based on the sort of uh, quick run through that you've had, 
how likely are you to promote the facilities and opportunities presented at St Abbs Marine Station to, to your respective institutes? Give everyone just a couple more seconds. Excellent. I'm glad there was zero or not likely. Um, I appreciate this was a really quick run through and it tried to cover a lot of information in a limited amount of time. But what we really hope this is, is it just opens the lines of communication um, with other people in marine research field. But as I mentioned, RS, anybody who's interested in St. Abbs, University of Edinburgh and this collaboration, um, we'd be more than happy to, to hear from you. And that's all from me. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you so much, Kevin. And thank you so much, Murray, uh, for uh, the talk that you've given. I hope that the answers that we've got from the polls are helpful uh, for future work and knowing what the science community are looking for. So, um, right, we've got a question. So I would like to uh, get Kevin and Murray uh, both on the screen so we work through the Q&As. If you have a question that you would like to ask both Kevin or Murray, please just pop it in the Q&A box that is at the bottom of the screen. Uh, do remember that this whole session has been recorded. So if you think, actually, I um, want to share this with someone or uh, I don't have time to stay for the Q&A, then put your question in and then check out the recording that you'll be able to find on the Masts uh, YouTube later today. So excellent, it's just us now. Um, so hopefully Murray is still on the line. We do have a question already in the Q&A box. So uh, they are a question that says about the education. Do you invite local communities or schools into the facility to see what's happening? Yes, uh, we, we do. And this has been something that we have done um, basically since the facility was completed. Um, we started with the local communities. We got involved with the local high school. Uh, we ran field courses there. We've also done stuff for primary schools. But one of the things that we're really interested in doing as well is expanding that out. So we've had people from, from all over the UK and, and the world, to be honest, who have been at different stages in education or have just had a general interest in the facility in general. Um, so what we've done in the past is we've had open days where we can bring a lot of people into the facility, share a bit about the research, a bit about the facilities, and just kind of open a, a conversation um, that's not necessarily focused on the science side of things, but more the engagement side. And that's something that we are, we are absolutely uh, keen to, to continue doing. I don't know if you have anything to add, Mary. Yeah, okay, go ahead, Mary. Wonderful. Yeah, uh, yeah, just to reiterate what Kevin said, and also from the university side in Edinburgh, um, we've been discussing this, we take that engagement really seriously, uh, looking at you know, enhancing what we do. Just a couple of examples. Um, the Roslyn Institute have a wonderful educational program and it runs throughout schools, particularly in Edinburgh, but sometimes further afield. So for instance, PCR can be run, kits sent to schools, but also they live stream their laboratory classes to high schools across Scotland. And that's something we'd be looking at in the future. So some apps could become a hub with you know, live streamed activities, even uh, we, we think now possible to live stream in water activities through the dive unit with full face mask communications and underwater cameras. We've in fact just resourced that recently. We've secured the funding and we're in the process of buying the equipment. So early days on that, but the, the, certainly the vision is there and we're really keen to talk with people who work in the schools outreach, community outreach areas so that we do the very best job we can, take that enormously seriously actually. Absolutely, that sounds great. So to the person who asked that question, I hope that was a good answer. If any of our people on the call right now uh, know any eager uh, science communicators who want to know more, uh, include more marine science, it sounds like this is a team that you should get in contact with. Irrespective of where you are, they may be able to do a lot of things with you wherever you are in Scotland. So we are getting in a flood of questions, which is great. Uh, I'm going to jump straight in. Uh, this sounds like it's from a student. They are um, asking, I was wondering whether you were offering internship opportunities for students this summer. They are a fourth year ecological environmental sciences student at the University of Edinburgh. Really happy to hear your question, Mathis. Maybe send me an email. We were talking about this very issue this morning, this very, very issue. And we have some plans that are in development 
but even and, and, and we can, I'm sure we can sort something out. So some of the postgraduate students are working at St. Abbs. We need to talk to you, get you connected with Kevin and his colleagues and see, see what we might be able to organize. But, but thanks for your, your question. I do hope we can be in touch. Uh, moving on to our next question, which is from Alejandra. Uh, not a question, but wanted to thank you on behalf of Marine Scotland Science for contributing to our Scottish Coastal Observatory, a long term series of environmental variables adequately collected are of great value to us and the international marine community. So uh, I guess that's just a, a good thumbs up from uh, other, uh, other marine groups in Scotland, which is really nice to see. I guess one thing to, to kind of add to this, and this has always been uh, at the forefront of our discussions, is the lack of kind of long term data, um, you know, measuring a range of different environmental factors. It's something that we, we really want to increase. Um, and I mean, that's a, a great example of something that has worked successfully. Um, but I know we do want to branch out and, and have a look at different data series that we can begin collecting. Hopefully we're going to be around for the long term. And I think we're, we're well suited um, to to help in data collection, whether that's on site or whether it's send samples elsewhere, is definitely something we're interested in. Just one quick sort of ad addendum to that. So the long-term monitoring is, is really key to, you know, that's a, a wonderful opportunity that can be expanded at St. Abbs. Um, we're also connecting with the Darwin Tree of Life project currently, and that's something we want to really see grow so that St. Abbs becomes an important node in the Darwin Tree of Life. And for those that aren't familiar, that's the initiative, uh, I think, through the Sanger Centre primarily to sequence every, or, you know, every organism in the, in the UK. I mean, it's a very, very ambitious programme of work. The Marine Biological Association are coordinating the marine species to be uh, fed into the Darwin Tree of Life. So we're interfacing with the MBA on that one. But if people are interested and want to be involved in the work that we are starting at St. Abbs, you know, very happy to talk about that as well. Excellent, thank you. Uh, can I just, because you've uh, just elaborated on uh, University of Edinburgh students potentially getting involved, I'm going to skip to Gustavo's question, which is uh, that they are a marine conservation and ecology student from Brazil, and they'd like to know about PhD sponsorship possibility for international students, uh, being able to compare participation on NPAs, NPA efficiency, systems and science, and EMP impact as well. So um, how does it work with international uh, people wanting to get involved with some abs as well? So Norm, so I think to, to be in touch with, with, with me or somebody else on the working group and start a discussion about what your specific interests are, there are bursary schemes, there are schemes that are available in Edinburgh and, and other Scottish universities as well. And don't take from this, you know, there's an exclusive relationship. I keep, keep coming back to that, you know, but you can be in touch with us in Edinburgh and, and elsewhere to look for opportunities. Given that you're in Brazil, um, I might put a link in the chat to the iAtlantic project website where we have a lot of Brazilian uh, universities and colleagues involved and a funded activity that includes actually some ongoing research in terms of long-term experiments, multi-stressor experiments that are running at St. Abs. So there are strong links to Brazil and maybe, you know, it, it depends on finding the right partnership, the right opportunity, and there are bursaries out there, but I can't, they are hard to get. So we have to have a very kind of long, long kind of planning on that. But Gustavo, if you'd like to send me a message and check the Atlantic website, very happy to pick up that idea. That'd be great. Yeah, lots of possibilities with this and um, absolutely just get in touch. And um, we're going to move on to Bernadette's question, which is, is she's wondering if the Marine Station has done any survey work relating to invasive non-native species in the past, or would you be open to this in the future? Absolutely. Um, we have had very, very minor input into a couple of different projects. Um, one was having a look at um, American lobsters or, or effectively crossbreeds. Um, we, we have had some information through about that. We haven't thankfully found any yet, um, but we do have a high turnover of animals. So we are in a good position to uh, be involved in this type of work. Um, we've also had a look at invasive sea squirts. Um, and this was more just done because we have tanks that have sea squirts naturally growing. Um, but yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think that's something that would be, we'd be really keen to do. Um, and I think could be easily done uh, from our side. So please do get in touch about it. 
Great, that's good to hear. Uh, our next question is from Anna, and uh, she was wondering if you could say a little bit more about uh, the support that can happen for under, if there's support out there for undergraduate field courses, especially the overnight accommodation and catering. Um, and also if you have dedicated research vessel uh, or hire boats as needed. Sure, shall I say something quickly and I'll pass to yeah, Kevin? Go ahead. So at the moment, it's a great question, Anna. So at the moment, one of the constraints in St. Labs is the physical space, and that physical space is dedicated to the marine station. But there are some local areas that are suitable. There's a local community hall that can be used. So we're now starting to use St. Abs in postgraduate field courses. So say between 20 and 30 people maximum, much more than that, and really it becomes very difficult. We're looking at a second phase of our development, and we're discussing that in some detail now about how we will be expanding upon the dry facility space in St. Abs. That will take some years to pull together, but we want to see courses developing in the meantime. And there is accommodation. Uh, well, we'll be using, for instance, the caravan sites in Coldingham. So our students will, will be staying in Coldingham. We, we ran a field course in the COVID era virtually by digitizing the seashore and bringing students virtually to St. Abs. This year, we're bringing uh, but about 30 students for a week to St. Abs. So it, it is feasible and very happy to take uh, requests on that to, to look at possibilities. But just a, a note of caution, the physical space is limited and we're not uh, set up like the Field Studies Council or others to run larger courses routinely. That's a, a longer term objective for us. And Kevin, in terms of boats and other ideas, maybe I'll pass it over to you. Yeah, thank you, Murray. Um, ju just to add on the point that you were making. So in the past, if we've had large groups coming down to visit, um, we do have contacts in different areas around Coldingham, St. Abs and local kind of community um, where we can offer different types of uh, accommodation. Um, we also have the, the volunteer hall, like Murray mentioned, um, and one of the, the parts of the Marine Station, which I have um, neglected to mention here, is the visitor centre. Now, I mean, this is uh, located in St. Abs as well and gives a bit of history to, to the local area. Um, but has also been used in the past for uh, hosting lectures and so on. So there is a bit of infrastructure there. Um, and we have made it work in the past with large groups of people, despite the, uh, the, the space restrictions that we do have. In terms of boat use, um, we have just typically relied on the local community. We have done work with uh, NIFCA um, and we do have the, the opportunity to potentially use their boats. But we use large dive boats. Uh, we'll typically charter it for a day or however long we need. Uh, which is a large enough vessel that you can take equipment out, you can take a group of people out and conduct work. Likewise, the fishermen are always happy to have you on their boat, uh, either for a dedicated purpose or just to, to tag along if you wish to collect animals or, or data that way. Great, thank you. Uh, yeah, just to highlight that, you know, this is a really new collaboration, so there's so much more potential that's going to come from it, uh, it sounds like. And um, also to highlight, this is not just Scotland-based um, engagement that uh, this collaboration is looking for. If you know people south of the border who would like to get in touch with, with this team, then please just pass the contact details. Um, from Kevin and Murray uh, to speak to them as well. Uh, I have a question. Um, which is a bit more, uh, when you were mentioning the Elasma Brank work that's happening, uh, this is also something curious, uh, a, a thought I had. Is it folk in St. Abs who have the home office license for that kind of work or can a researcher who has the, without a license come forward and do Elasma Brank work? This is just, when you were talking about it, I know that home office license is, is a thing with this type of research. Yes, uh, it is an absolute minefield, to be honest. Mm. Um, well, through this new collaboration, we are in a great position that we can actually work through the University of Edinburgh's uh, Home Office license. They have perfect contacts that have helped us along every step of this application. You know, we've had uh, constant meetings. Uh, we've had revisions on, on the work that we're doing because it's new to us as well. A lot of the, the species that we've done in the past haven't required it. We've worked on marine invertebrates. So this is really our first kind of foray into uh, working on a licensed species. Um, so with this project in particular, we will be using the University of Edinburgh's uh, establishment license. We will be uh, a separate place of work. Um, the actual project and the, the, the people, individual who will be working on this project are marine station staff. 
Um, that is not to say that other people couldn't join on um, if, if we could get the appropriate paperwork done. Uh, we really want to maximize the usefulness whilst we have these elasmobranchs in tanks because as you've seen from the picture, 15 meter long, it's a very large tank and that's kind of what these animals need. So I know we're working uh, with the Dick Vet in Edinburgh um, and if we have any mortalities or if we have excess blood samples, we can send it to them and they can get as much information from this whilst we have them as well. So yeah, it, it's a kind of mixed model, but it's working well for us having access to, to Edinburgh resources and uh, specialized staff, particularly to do with the Home Office. It's helped us a lot. Yeah, I, I forgot about the link with the, the, uh, the veterinary school as well. So that's really good. Um... Uh, affiliation that you have as well. Um, we don't have any other questions in at the minute, and that was my question uh, that I wanted to pose to you. So if anyone has a burning question right now, then please do type it in the Q&A box that you can see at the bottom of the screen. Do remember that this whole session was recorded, so if you want to check it out or share it with someone, it's going to be on our last YouTube channel at the end of today. Um, any other final uh, things that you would like to say, Mari or Kevin, whilst we have a few more minutes? I don't think so. Just thank you all very much for being with us today and please, please be in touch. And thanks, Hannah, for, for hosting us and organising everything so beautifully. Oh, that's quite all right. You're a great kickoff to the Mask <laughs> webinar series. Oh, which I should say, I'll put the sign up link in the chat in just a second for anyone who wants to check out what we have coming up uh, every month as well. So um, no other questions have come in. So I think we have a happy audience. Thank you very much, Kevin and Murray, for uh, kicking off the webinar series and telling us all about your new exciting collaboration. It was really good to hear.